Good morning. I'm glad to have everyone with us today. We do want to keep David in our prayers as he's dealing with his issues at this time. When I got the call about David not being here, I started looking and thinking about some lessons and some things that I think would be uh, appropriate for us today. Some things because of of the way our world in general is going, not just our country. We know our country is in turmoil, but you see it all over the world. And part of the problem with what our world deals with is people who are self-centered and arrogant. And because of that kind of attitude, we deal with all these problems. The rioting, the looting, the killing, the uh, assaults, and the violence that we see going on in our country it boils down to one thing. People are selfish. They want their way. When they don't get their way, they're going to do whatever they can to make others suffer. And that's not what Christians do. That shouldn't be what anybody does. But unfortunately, we live in a world where this is what we're facing now. So this morning, I want to look at a lesson about humility. If we live our lives in such a way that we humble ourselves before God and even before a fellow man, We'll do away with a lot of the problems that we have in this world. But like I said just a minute ago, the problem is people don't want to be humble anymore. They want to be selfish and arrogant and prideful. They want to have their own way. We live in a society where it's about me, 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 instead of about what I can do for other people. A humble person is not proud or arrogant. A humble person is modest in disposition. Modest is not just dealing with one's clothing. When you read about modesty in the Bible, even dealing with one's clothing, it always goes back to a state of mind. It goes back to an attitude. So modesty is having or showing a moderate or humble estimate of one's own merits, importance, free from any vanity, egotism, boastfulness, or any great pretensions about oneself. A person can possess pride in both positive and negative ways, or either a positive or a negative way. Pride in itself is not a sin. It's arrogant pride that makes it a sin. What do we mean by that? If we're proud of who we are, or proud of the life we're living as a Christian, and we're humbling ourselves before God, that's a positive type of pride to have. We're taking pride in our appearance, in our life, in our attitude. But a... Pride which is condemned is one that one possesses a higher inordinate opinion about their own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority, whether it is cherished in their mind or displayed in their actions. That's the kind of pride that's condemned in the Bible. And that's the kind of pride that we must condemn today and not possess in our own lives. So as we start in our lesson this morning, I want us to think about how we can and need to be humble today in our lives. First of all, we not only need to, but must be humble before God. When we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, we need to go in humility. We shouldn't go like the self-righteous, arrogant Pharisee did in Luke chapter 18 when he boasted of his righteousness in his prayer. If you look in Luke 18 verses 9 through 14... We can read this. And he spake a parable unto the certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into a temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I possess. Now that was the Pharisee's prayer. Look how arrogant and prideful and boastful he was. Let's go further. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One man was telling God how great he is and how fortunate God was to have someone like him. The other is begging for mercy. Because he knows that he makes mistakes and sins. 
He goes on in this passage and said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Two different men, two different attitudes. One of arrogance and pride, the other of humility. And in verse 14, as Jesus is giving this parable, he tells us the one that exalts himself is going to be abased. He's going to be brought low. In other words, he's going to be knocked down a few notches. But the one who humbles himself is going to be exalted. So what would you rather have in your life today? Would you rather God exalt you because of your humility or knock you down a few notches because of arrogance and pride? People in the world still don't care about that because they still think they're going to get what they want. But for us who are Christians, we know what the answer is. We know that we want to live a life of humility rather than the life of arrogance and pride. I mean, you just look at the contrast, it just stands out, it's blaring. The first thing I thought of, and you younger folks probably won't even know any of this, a man by the name of Cassius Clay. <laughs> Buddy knew where I was going with this. Or as he's most well known as Muhammad Ali. Now, Muhammad Ali had a lot of great quotes. I went back and read some of them. He had some sensible quotes. Some of them are not so sensible. But one of his famous ones was, he floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. But I think his other probably most prominent quote was, I am the greatest. In researching this, because I hadn't read about Muhammad Ali in a long time, I went back and started looking at some things about his life, and I found an article. And this article went through Muhammad Ali's boxing career. And he started using that phrase, I am the greatest, according to this article, it said when he was only mediocre. He said he wasn't even that great a boxer when he started making that statement. But he is telling everybody he was the greatest. Whether that was becoming a state of mind of his or just pride and arrogance. He did become one of the greatest boxers, and he's still known as possibly the greatest boxer of the 20th century. After going back and reading some other boxing stories, and I, I like boxing, I, I don't know so much about that. He was a great boxer. You go back in the late 18, early 1900s, you had boxers that would go 20 and 25 and 30 rounds till one of them just couldn't stand any more than knocked each other out. Well, they didn't do that when Muhammad Ali was boxing. They stopped him at 15 rounds. But he was a good boxer. But having that kind of arrogance and pride to say, I am the greatest, is not the way we should portray ourselves to anyone. However, according to what the Bible teaches and showing our humility, we do that to submit to God's will. In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, the Bible teaches us that we're to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Notice that verse tells us that we're to humble ourselves. That's how He starts the verse off. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And what does it say that He's going to do for us if we humble ourselves to Him? He's going to exalt us. That's exactly what Jesus said in Luke 18, verse 14. So we're in our humility, we're to cast our cares upon Him, express our cares and concerns unto the Heavenly Father, because He does care for us. God is pleased with those who are submissive to Him and has reverence for Him. In due time, God is going to exalt those who are humble. So we should be encouraged in our lives to cast our care upon him in humility. Not stand as a Pharisee in prayer saying, God, I'm glad I don't like other people. I'm a whole lot better than my old neighbors over here and I'm a whole lot better than, than some of my family and some of those folks down, down at the church, I'm a whole lot better than them too. We don't have that attitude, do we? Christians carry the attitude of God, I thank you for all you've done for me. And here are my cares and concerns and needs. We're going to get into a verse that tells us about that just in a minute. 
But there's a sense in which we approach God boldly in prayer as well. And approaching him boldly is still approaching him in humility because it's having the assurance and confidence that he's going to hear and answer our prayers when we express them in humility and according to the harmony of his will. For instance, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now notice verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We can boldly come before the throne of grace. That's not in arrogance. That's not like the Pharisee came to him. But it's in humility, having the confidence, knowing that as we're serving God faithfully and doing his will and living in harmony with his will, that he's going to answer our prayer. That's how we go boldly. That's different than the Pharisee prayed, isn't it? John wrote in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that our petitions uh, that we have desired of him. So we have those petitions we've desired of him and we can come with confidence. That's the boldness that we read about in the Hebrew letter. Next, not only do we need to be humble before God, but we need to be humble before our fellow man and our, for our brethren, rather. We need to be humble before our brethren. Rather than pushing ourselves in front of others, we should place others above ourselves. That's what Paul wrote to Philippians. If you look in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem the other better than himself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, he's telling us, first of all, don't do things through strife or trying to exalt ourselves in vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, humility, we esteem others better than ourselves. We ought to live the kind of lives that when we're dealing with our brethren, we shouldn't say, no, I want to be the one up here. I want to be the one doing this. I'm pretty good at what I do. I think I need to do this other, over other people or whatever the case may be. We should help exalt and build up other people rather than ourselves. We can brag about how much we've done. We can brag about how much we know. But being humble and putting others first is what the Bible teaches us. It could be that uh, we have a new song leader start out. Let me just use that as an example. New song leader. And a person's learning but maybe one of the experienced will say, oh, I'm going to get up and lead because I can lead better than you. We don't have that here, fortunately. But I've seen that. What we should do is be teaching these younger and newer ones coming up, here's how you do things and here's what you do. One congregation of which I was a part for several years had training classes once a month. And not only did the regular song leaders get up and lead a song and in doing so in, in this training, the younger ones were brought up. The young men were brought up who were trying to learn. And they were taught how to direct singing. They were taught what to do and how to do things in preparing them. And then several Wednesday nights, one of those young men would get up and they would lead the singing for the Wednesday night service, starting them off slowly and teaching them different ways. That's bringing people up and stepping in the background. Sometimes we need to step in the background and put others in front of us. Colossians 3 tells us in verses 12 through 14, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel with any, even as Christ forgave you, even so do ye. And above all, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. We put on love and humility. He said that is the bond of perfectness. That shows maturity and growth. The Ephesian writer, or Paul wrote to the Ephesians, rather, in Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, has forgiven you. Instead of arrogantly approaching even our erring brethren, 
And we have brethren even here who have heard from the truth. Instead of arrogantly approaching them saying, you're wrong and you're going straight to hell. That's going to be the case. But you approach them in such a way that you make them ashamed of their sins and make them want to repent. I'm not saying back off and compromise. That's not what we're talking about. But there's a way that we deal with our brethren, a way we can deal with things, and do it in a matter of humility and being tender-hearted. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one, notice this last phrase, in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So we're going humility to those who are overtaken in the fault. And these are not people that we talk about who's lived a life of sin and are arrogant and prideful. Overtaken in the fault is like when a thief jumps out and robs somebody. Here's a person who might have been living a faithful life and slipped up in a moment and did something they shouldn't have. And they walked into something that they still sin and they knew they did, but they got caught up in something. They're overtaken. We which are spiritual, we restore them. Because most of the time a person like that's going to have the attitude of repentance and want to make the changes. We also need to keep in mind that we're not above being tempted. Next, we need to be humble before our fellow man. We should keep in mind that we have obtained salvation through the Son of God and His death on the cross, not because of our own goodness, because of what He did on the cross for us and through our humility and our penance, through our faith changing in repentance, having the willingness to confess Jesus with the mouth and be immersed in baptism for the remission of our sins, we put on Christ and we're saved by the blood of Christ. And doing that, we need to live the kind of life that we can influence, be the example that we need to be through humility to our fellow man. Not only our brethren in Christ who are already saved, but those who are not. We need to live that moral life in harmony with the principles taught in the Bible and submit to the Lord's commandments. We're all accountable to God and none of us can save ourselves with our own merit. We save ourselves through the blood of Christ by being a faithful child of God. And with this in mind, we shouldn't have I'm a better than you attitude when it comes to dealing with the lost and dealing with our, our fellow man. That's the attitude the self-righteous Pharisee had. That's what we don't want. So even dealing with ranked sinners, we still have the humility of mind as we deal with them to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ to save their soul. Does it mean they're going to obey? It doesn't. They have to make the choice. And they may be so arrogant and prideful that they don't care. They don't want to hear it. If you've ever studied with someone in your life or more than a per, one or two people in your life, you've had somebody do that to you or say that to you. All of us have if we've talked to someone about the gospel. I've had people tell me, I don't really care what you believe. I don't care what you do. I don't want it and don't believe it. That's going to happen to any one of us. doesn't mean we give up and stop. It means we've given them the opportunity and they rejected it. That's on them. We did our part. In Paul and Barnabas' missionary journey to Asia Minor, they preached in Derby. And when the apostle Paul, by the power of God, had healed a man who had been born lame, unable to walk, the heathens in the city thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods who came down to them. These two men of God were shocked when the people were going up to make sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas and worship them. And here's what Paul said to them in Acts 4.15. Sir, sirs, why do you do these things? We're all like uh, men of like passions with you and preaching to you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God which, were made, which made heaven and earth and sea and all that are in them therein. Just notice, Paul and Barnabas wouldn't allow these people to exalt them and worship them and put them up on a pedestal because of their humility. Because they knew it was wrong. You only worship God, not man. And Paul and Barnabas knew that. But they had to teach these others who didn't know that. And they said, we're of like passions like you. We're men. We're humans. We don't worship each other. We exalt and worship God. 
this I believe would be in contrast to some today who because of their position maybe in religion wear special, special clothing to stand out and wear special religious titles I see this all the time and you do too people will walk around I'm the great reverend so and so or I'm pastor so and so and you can address me as such they want these big religious titles. They want to be exalted and stand out. They put on these special clothing and garments that make them stand out. Not long after Sonia and I got married and went into a, just a regular denominational religious bookstore, and we walked in and they had all these different colors of robes and things for the so-called pastors to wear, and I stopped and looked at them. I said, what color do you think I ought to pick out? She said, keep on walking. <laughs> Of course, you knew I was joking. But that's the way, the way a lot of religious leaders want to do and want to be. They want to stand out because they're the great honorable or the great reverend or the great this or the great that. And they call themselves such. And folks, we should be humbling ourselves, not exalting ourselves. In Matthew 23, this tells us not only about the religious leaders of Jesus' day, but even the religious leaders of our day. Verses 5 through 12 says, But all their works they do are to be seen of men. For they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uttermost rooms at the feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man on, upon a father upon the earth. For one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. This describes exactly what we're dealing with in religious circles today, where men want to be called rabbi, reverend, pastor, bishop, apostle, or father. They want these big titles, and that's exactly what Jesus condemned in this passage. And men wear those titles a day and they cannot even see this. If they even read their Bibles, they cannot even see what he's talking about here. People exalting themselves above others. We're not to look down upon others for any reason. Their social standing, their race, their nationality, or whether or not they're male or female. We don't look down upon people because of those things. We don't look at their social standing and say, oh, you're not good enough to talk to me. Or their race. I know there's a lot going in our country today about race. And there's a lot of things that are being said. Everything seems like it's racist today. I saw an article the other day that there was some big white rock somewhere, and now they're calling that white rock racist. Now tell me how a rock can be racist. And the same way with the black rocks or black things when I worked in the county jail we had a, an inmate that was he was a white supremacist and he was so bad he wouldn't even drink chocolate milk because it was brown that's how bad he was and someone offered him chocolate milk one day and he said no if it's white it's got to be right give me the white milk now, when people get to that point that they can't even drink a different colored milk because of that racist, that's racism. That's true racism to its core. But having an inanimate object that's not a color that one might approve of, the rock can't help what color it is. It's a rock. And when you start calling that racist, then the person doing that is a person that's racist. We're dealing with all kinds of issues in, our, in this country today, and it's because of arrogance and pride. We don't look down upon people because of their race, their color, anything. And if we do, we're wrong. We have to humble ourselves before God. In Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Does it say in every nation of a certain creed, color, nationality? No, it doesn't. Does it say of a certain social standing? James 2 deals with prejudice from the social standpoint. 
It doesn't say any of that. Every nation, anyone who fears God and follows Him, obeys Him, works righteousness, is accepted by Him. We as Christians are responsible to be good examples to our fellow man. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light shine before men. Who? Everybody. So they can see our good works. Whether one is striving to reach an erring brother who has fallen or one who has not obeyed the gospel at all, we approach them in a loving but firm manner. And it's still done in humility. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26, Paul wrote Timothy, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. If peradventure God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who is taken captive, captive by him at his will. We need to be humble before our fellow man. Finally, we need to possess humility toward ourselves. Solomon had much to say about avoiding pride and rather being humble. In Proverbs 29, 23, Solomon wrote, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. He's talking about lowly is those who are humble. Proverbs 6, 18 and 19, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better is it to be a humble spirit with a lowly than divide the spoils with the proud. Proverbs 18, verse 12 says, Before destruction the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. Paul wrote the Galatians in Galatians 6, 3 and says, If a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We think we're really something and we're really not. We've let pride deceive us. If we want to look at our perfect example of humility, we can look at Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. We can follow that example and all these other examples that we've been studying this morning. We can see the type of humility we should possess as Christians and must possess if we're going to go to heaven. We're in, entering into time of holiday seasons where this next week we observe Thanksgiving. We observe it once a year as a nation. We should observe it every day as a Christian. In our humility, we should be thankful for all that God has done for us and live our lives in a humble service to Him so that heaven one day will be our home in heaven. And we know that it will be if we do serve Him faithfully. I hope that we all realize that in the Lord's kingdom, we're here to serve, not to be served. We're here to help, not to hurt. We're here to be faithful children of God and do so humbly. As a child of God, maybe you're not living as you should. Maybe you've lived an arrogant, prideful life, or maybe you've let things come between you and God because of pride. Because when we sin, it's the pride of our heart deceiving us and doing things that we know that we shouldn't be doing. We humble ourselves and repent of those sins, God will forgive us. As one of God's children, if you have fallen away, you can come back today as we sing an invitation song just in a moment to repent of your sins, confess them, and prayers will be offered on your behalf. And as you change your life and 
began living a, a life once again of humility and faithfulness, God will continue to bless you and heaven will be yours. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed Jesus Christ, then why not come today to do so? Do you believe with all your heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Then if so, you need to repent of your sins. Upon changing your life and repenting of your sins, you confess your faith in Jesus and are immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins to reach the blood of Christ and be saved by that precious blood. Live a life of humility and heaven will be yours one day. If you're subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, come right now. Why together we're standing while we sing?